This is such a wonderful program by the American String Quartet here at Cole Mansion. You're going to hear four examples of some of the most heartfelt and sincere chamber music ever written. It's thoughtfully conceived in a few different ways, and personally, I'm really excited to hear it. Many of us know Mozart was bad with money, buried in a pauper's grave. Or we might think of Beethoven, the maverick, way ahead of his time, as the uncompromising deaf musician banging on the keyboard well into the night. But today's list of composers challenges those stereotypes in a few different ways. All four were quite well known during their own lives. They enjoyed financial success as well as fame. Haydn and Brahms in particular were superstars. Brahms had more money than he knew what to do with. And George Walker and Samuel Barber were riddled with accolades during their own lifetimes. The Haydn Opus 76 number no. 5 is one of those trapped on a desert island pieces, one of the first pieces every string player wants to read at a chamber music party. Haydn wrote so much, 104 symphonies, 68 string quartets, over 150 trios, 126 of which are for the now obsolete instrument, the baritone, 52 piano sonatas, 14 masses, 26 operas, I could keep going. But he really gave new meaning to the concept of productivity. 200 years later, even the best of us still seem lazy by comparison. With so much to choose from, it's hard to pick what's best, but let's just say this quartet is on the short list. Haydn really established the string quartet as a medium. In fact, he established the entire classical style. Mozart and Beethoven both emulated him repeatedly. Mozart dedicated his first six string quartets to Haydn, uncharacteristically slaving over them in an attempt to get everything just right. Haydn's sense of form and proportion was simply flawless, so much so that when he does break out of the mold, it's always a very deliberate choice. By the time Haydn wrote the Opus 76 quartets in 1797, he already had a few dozen quartets under his belt. Haydn had established the quartet as a new paradigm, already light years past its predecessor, the Italian Baroque Trio Sonata, these four movement works set a mold that composers still emulate today. His themes show never-ending variation, another new concept for the time. Most of his predecessors simply repeated their themes over and over in one key after another. He showed versatility, sometimes with the traditional melody and accompaniment, like the opening of these movements, and sometimes with virtuosic and complex writing that's evenly distributed among the voices, where the whole is really greater than the sum of the parts. Haydn was born into humble beginnings, but spent most of his adult life as Kapellmeister, or court composer, for the Esterhazy family. Like all court composers, he had to remain eager to please at the end of the day. Remember those 126 baritone trios I mentioned? But they paid him well, and he wanted for nothing. One of his contracts stipulates how much wine he would receive every year. Uh, one year it got up to 18 buckets, with roughly 60 liters per bucket that works out to nearly four bottles a day. The only area of his life where he wasn't successful was his marriage. His wife, Maria Anna Aloysia, was a rather difficult woman with no appreciation for her husband's talents whatsoever. She reportedly ripped up his scores to curl her hair and line her baking tins. They basically led separate lives in the same palace. There were affairs, even other children, but he never remarried. Now fast forward to the 20th century and the work of Samuel Barber to his Adagio, which is just simply stunning. He wrote it when he was only 25 years old. It was the middle movement of his first and only string quartet, performed first in 1936, and then the Adagio was performed as a standalone work just two years later in a live radio broadcast by Arturo Toscanini leading the NBC Orchestra. Over a million people tuned in. Since then, it has become the piece Americans go to when words fail. It was performed at FDR's funeral, as well as Einstein's, Princess Grace of Monaco's, JFK's memorial, the list goes on. In addition to numerous 9-11 and COVID tributes, it's been featured in the movies Elephant Man and Platoon. Curiously, however, Barber forbade its performance at his own memorial. He entered the inaugural class of the Curtis Institute of Music when he was just 14 years old. 
and Curtis was the place where Barber studied everything musical. He studied piano, voice, conducting with Fritz Reiner, and composition with Scalero, the same teacher as George Walker. Their founder, Mary Louise Curtis Bach, was one of Barber's biggest supporters and benefactors. The faculty and students alike performed his pieces. In fact, this quartet was originally scheduled to be performed by the Curtis Quartet, but Barber didn't finish it in time, and the Pro Arte Quartet ended up premiering it in Rome in 1936. He lived most of his adult life with fellow composer and Curtis classmate Giancarlo Minotti, but after 40 years together, the two separated. I remember a story that the conductor Christopher Keene relayed to me uh, when I was at Minotti's Spoleto Festival. He'd worked with Barber many times directly, and evidently they only would invite him to the rehearsals after happy hour because I guess he was just too difficult to deal with before a couple of martinis. He was extremely learned and extremely intelligent and was prone to brooding. No doubt his sexuality played a role in all this, but his music is lyrical, passionate, and distinctly American. George Walker was another Curtis graduate and a real trailblazer. He was the first black man to play a recital in New York's Town Hall back in 1945, the first black instrumentalist to solo with the Philadelphia Orchestra, the first black graduate of Curtis, and the first black person to win a Pulitzer Prize in music. He grew up in Washington, D.C., where he began piano lessons at the age of five. He gave his first public recital at Howard University at age 14, then went on to Oberlin College and then Curtis, where he studied composition with Rosario Scalero, Barber's teacher, and then Barber himself. He went on to Paris to study with the famous Nadia Boulanger. Uh, she basically taught everyone who's everyone in the 20th century, from Leonard Bernstein to Piazzolla. And evidently, she was so impressed with Walker's work that she waived all of her normal prerequisites, saying from the start that he could bring her whatever he wanted. George Walker went on to teach at New York's New School, Rutgers University, where he chaired the department, the University of Colorado, Peabody, University of Delaware, and Smith College, where he became the first black faculty member to get tenure. He received six honorary doctorates, including ones from Oberlin, Curtis, and Spelman College. Obviously very learned and steeped in the classical tradition, he frequently drew material from spirituals and jazz as well. This lament from his first string quartet was written at the age of just 25, shortly after the death of his grandmother. It's one of his most popular works. George Walker died just four years ago at age 96, and coincidentally, his son Ian lives in San Francisco as a playwright. The final piece on the program is the A minor quartet of Johannes Brahms. Truly a complex character, he was a man of many contrasts, and it's directly reflected in his music. Like Barber and even Haydn before that, he built on the tradition of his day, honing chamber music and symphonies at a time when Wagner was writing increasingly atonal music dramas and larger and larger operas. He saw himself as an heir to Bach and Beethoven, not so much in a presumptuous way, but more in the sense that he took his work really seriously. He was such a perfectionist, in fact, that he wrote 20 string quartets before the three we know today. 20. That's 20 drafts of entire pieces that he later burned. In fact, it seems that the music we know today is probably less than a third of what he actually wrote. Unlike Beethoven, who scribbled bits in one notebook after another, Brahms destroyed everything that wasn't up to snuff. Not only music, but also receipts and letters as well. He hated interviews, hated biographers, and hated giving autographs. But he loved children and loved animals. Evidently, he was so kind to the women at his local post office, where he frequently appeared with large parcels, that they used to argue about who actually got to help him. He grew up in the red light district of Hamburg. Scholars disagree about the notion of him performing in brothels. It seems that he was underage and music wasn't even allowed in brothels at the time, but suffice it to say, he was no stranger to prostitutes. He entered puberty extremely late. By some accounts, his voice didn't change until 20, and the long hipster-like beard that he grew later in life may have just simply been compensation for a very prolonged boyhood. His talent was obvious from an early age. His first composition teacher, Markson, insisted on giving him free lessons four times a week. 
This benevolence obviously carried over later in Brahm's life, where he supported many people who were down on their luck. He bailed Antonin Dvorak out of bankruptcy twice. In fact, he said that Dvorak should consider Brahm's fortune as his own. At one point in a crafty business maneuver, Brahms' publisher bought up the copyrights to all of his earlier music. I'm reminded of Michael Jackson and the Beatles' back catalog. But Brahms was actually so touched in the confidence that Simrock, the publisher, displayed that he went so far as to forego any future royalties, claiming he already had more than enough money. But even a shrewd businessman like Simrock couldn't go along with that, so he eventually talked him out of it in the end. Brahms befriended the violin virtuoso Josef Joachim early in his career. They toured many times as a violin and piano duo, and Brahms wrote the violin concerto and double concerto for Joachim. They maintained a close friendship for decades, but like everyone else in Brahms' life, there were moments of friction. You see, we think this A minor quartet was originally intended for Joachim. Joachim had the motto F-A-E, Frei aber einsam, free but lonely. The notes F-A-E are featured in the opening theme of the A minor quartet. Probably not a coincidence. Earlier, in 1853, Brahms had assembled the world's best birthday present for Joachim, a violin sonata with his own monogram, or at least his own motto. Known now as the FAE Sonata, Frei Arbo Einsam, Albert Dietrich wrote the first movement, Robert Schumann wrote the second and fourth movements, and Brahms wrote the third movement, the scherzo. There's a secondary response you hear in this A minor quartet, FAF, Frei Arbo Fro or free but glad, that appears also in multiple works. So why isn't the A minor quartet dedicated to Joachim? We're not 100% sure. Remember, he kept no journals and set fire to most of his scores. So we think it was the result of a spat between these two lifelong friends. Originally, Joachim had planned a performance of the Brahms German Requiem for the opening of a Schumann festival. Brahms assumed that he would conduct. But long story short, the festival committee ended up programming something else entirely. Brahms got super offended and blamed Joachim for it. The two friends eventually patched things up, but that's probably why the A minor quartet is dedicated to Theodor Billroth and not Joachim. This is such a great program. You'll hear a wide range of writing from brilliant and virtuosic to lush and heartfelt. I can't think of a better collection of pieces to showcase the versatility and expressive potential of the string quartet. I really hope you enjoy it.